You know the classic questions, the questions like, who are we, where did we come from, why are we here? Every culture has answers to those questions. Every worldview seeks to answer them. And the Bible has answers to those questions as well. In Genesis chapter one, it tells us that God created everything that exists, everything that we can see, everything we can't see. In Genesis chapter one, it tells us that God created spaces and then he filled those spaces with everything that exists. In chapter two, there's a focus on day six when God created the human beings. It tells us that God created human beings in his own image. And it doesn't mean that he created us to look like him. In fact, we can see from the very job that he gave the human beings that he created us to be his representatives in the rest of creation. The word image, which is the word in English that the Hebrew word is translated into, means to be God's representative. And we can see from the job that God gave the human beings that that's what we were created to be. Of all the created beings, the humans were the only ones given the job of ruling over the rest of the creation. Let's look at it in chapter 1, verse 28. It says, God blessed the humans and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves over the earth. So human beings were morally accountable to God for the way that they ruled over the earth. In chapter two, which is the close up of day six when God created the human beings, God showed his authority over creation by making the human beings accountable to him through the giving of a command. Now, you might wonder why God gets to make the rules and human beings are accountable to obey the rule. But if you think about it, God's the creator. The human beings are the creations. So of course God gets to make the rules. And in reigning over creation, the creatures are responsible to the creator. God only gave one command when he exerted his authority over creation. And that one command was in the form of a boundary for the good of the human being. When the command was given, Adam was actually the only human being that had been created so far. And in Genesis chapter two, it tells us that God gave Adam this command saying, Adam, of everything in all the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat. And in the day that you do, you will surely die. God clearly stated the command and he clearly stated the penalty. In the day that you eat, you will die. Now, at the end of the creation account, it makes it very clear that God declared all of creation to be very good. So at the conclusion of the creation, there was goodness, there was provision for all the needs of the human beings, and at the close of chapter two, as the man and the woman are brought together to be companions and helpmates to one another, to serve as God's representatives over all of creation, they are naked and without shame in the presence of one another and in the presence of God. They had been created to be in his presence, to be in close personal relationship with him as the only part of creation that had the spirit of God living within them. Because when God had created Adam as a living being, he had breathed the breath of life into him and Adam had become a living soul. Now, we don't know how long they had lived in this state of perfection. 
But we know that by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, there is another creature in creation. It tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that there is a crafty creature called the serpent. Now, other parts of the Bible tell us that the serpent is Satan. And Satan is the enemy of our souls. You know, Satan is described in other places in the Bible as an angel of light, the father of lies, and a murderer from the beginning. And it's in Genesis 3 that we learn why he has that description. Because it's in Genesis 3 that we learn what happened to God's very good creation. God had declared that it was very good and it was sufficient to meet all the needs that the humans had and that the humans would be able to represent God adequately in his very good creation. But the serpent launched a spiritual warfare against the human beings, beginning with the woman. It tells us in Genesis 3 that he used a very careful tactic. Now listen to his tactics because they haven't changed. And as you listen to this, you may recognize some of the very tactics he might have used in your own life. Because as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. And the very same temptations that were used in Genesis 3 are the same temptations that are used today. The first thing the serpent did was to cast doubt on the word of God when he said to Eve, did God really say you are not to eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Well, Eve responded, he did say that. In fact, he said, we shouldn't even touch it. Now, Eve was a little off in her understanding of God's word, and she added to what God had said. That's never a good idea. But then Satan went another step further by denying the existence of sin and the penalty that comes from sin. Now, do you remember what God said the penalty would be? He said the penalty would surely be death. But at this point, Satan says, you will not surely die. And then the next deadly temptation, the next deadly tactic, Satan casts doubt on the goodness of God's character by making it sound as though through the boundaries God has established for the human's own good, he is keeping them from having something that would be good for them. Satan says, God does not want you to have the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you eat of that, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. You see, Satan made Eve think that God was keeping something good from her, something that would make her more able than she had been created. And so suddenly, as Eve looked at that tree and the fruit on that tree, it began to look different. Now, how long had the tree been there? It had been there her whole life. It was no different, but suddenly it began to look different to her. And that's how temptation works. That's how deception works. Something that is deadly begins to look so very good. And Eve took of the fruit and ate. And you know what it says, the next thing that happened is that she gave of the fruit to her husband who was right there with her, and he ate also. And the result of that sin was a cosmic catastrophe that affected all of creation right then and every single human being who has been born since that time. You see, sin was transmitted from our original human parents down to every single one of us now. If you examine your heart, you know for sure 
that you have stepped across God's boundaries also. That's the definition of sin, to go your own way instead of God's way. You know, that very day when sin entered God's good creation, he made a promise that one day in his own timing, he would send someone he referred to as the seed of a woman who would reverse the consequences of sin and death that started that day. If you'd like to know more about how God would bring about the fulfillment of that promise, tune in to more of the Fresh Start series and you'll learn more about how God, through the Old Testament histories, promised and moved in human history to bring about the seed of a woman who would reverse the consequence of sin and death that began that day.